Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown, and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go. When my father passed away a few years ago, my mother, bless her heart, was devastated. She'd been with dad for over four decades, and suddenly, she was alone in their big family home. I stepped up to help her manage things taking over the bills and whatnot. It wasn't easy, but we managed. As time passed, Mum decided she couldn't bear living in that house anymore. Too many memories, she said. So we decided to sell up and downsize. It was a hectic time filled with paperwork, packing, and canceling services. I distinctly remember calling the phone and broadband company to cancel everything. The lady on the phone was helpful, and I thought that was that. Fast forward a few months after mom had settled into her new place. I'm sorting through my mail when I spot an official looking letter. Opening it, I felt my stomach drop. A debt collection agency was claiming I owed them over 134 pounds, including interest and fees. I was baffled. I always paid my bills on time. What was this about? I immediately called the number on the letter. I explained to the agent that I had received a letter about an outstanding debt but wasn't sure what it was for. The agent asked for the reference number on the letter which I provided. After some clicking, the agent told me that the debt was regarding an unpaid broadband service at my old address. I thought I'd cancelled everything. I told the agent there must be some mistake, as I had cancelled the phone and broadband package when we sold the house. The agent said they'd need to refer this back to the supplier and that they'd be in touch. A few days later, I got a call from the broadband company. The company representative told me they were unable to cancel the broadband part of the service because the cancellation request didn't come from the account holder. I was confused and explained that I was the account holder and had been managing the account for years. The representative apologized but said their records showed the account holder as my father. I felt like I was in some kind of twisted dream. I tried to explain that. There had been a mix-up that my father had passed away years ago and that I'd been managing and paying for the account since then. The representative said they understood but could only discuss this matter with the account holder and could no longer speak with me about it. Frustrated, I pointed out that they were sending me collection letters and asked how they could threaten me with legal action but refused to talk to me. The representative simply repeated that those were their policies. This back and forth went on for weeks. Letters kept coming, threats of legal action escalated, but they wouldn't budge. It was infuriating and absurd. That's when I had an idea. A crazy, probably disrespectful idea, but I was at my wit's end. I drove to the cemetery where Dad was buried. It was a beautiful, peaceful place. Birds were chirping, and a light breeze rustled through the trees. I found Dad's grave and took a deep breath before dialing the company's number. When the company representative answered, I said I was calling about the account under my father's name. They asked if I was the account holder. I told them the account holder was here and they could speak to him if they'd like. I placed the phone on dad's headstone and walked away, giving them some privacy. I could hear muffled, increasingly frustrated voices coming from the phone. After a few minutes, I returned and picked up the phone. I asked if they'd had any luck speaking with the account holder. The company representative, now sounding angry, demanded to know what was going on and if this was some kind of joke. I calmly explained that it wasn't a joke at all. I told them that they had insisted on speaking with the account holder, so I was at the cemetery. I offered to give them the plot number and explained that my father had been there for a couple of years now, under about six feet of dirt. I added that I'd love to know if he had said anything to them because I hadn't been able to reach him myself. There was a long, heavy silence on the other end. Then the representative asked me to hold for a manager. A new voice came on the line, sounding much more subdued. The manager apologized for the situation and assured me they'd sort it out immediately. They promised I wouldn't be hearing from them or the collection agency again. True to their word, about a month later, I received a letter from the debt collection agency stating the matter had been resolved with no balance owing. As I stood there in the cemetery looking at Dad's headstone, I spoke to Dad, saying that it looked like he was still helping me out even from beyond, 
and thanked him for the assist. I placed a small stone on his grave, a tradition in our family. Sometimes it takes going to extreme lengths to get through to people. But I like to think Dad would have appreciated the humor in it all. When my wife and I first moved into our new house, everything seemed perfect. The house was beautiful, the street was peaceful, and most of our neighbors were friendly, except for one. The woman next door, who I'll call Karen, made it clear from day one that she didn't approve of us. She'd glare at us from her window whenever we were outside, and she'd make snide comments about our lawn care or the color we painted our shutters. We tried to be polite and wave hello, but she'd just turn her nose up and look away. Things came to a head when we started planning our youngest daughter's birthday party. She was turning five and we wanted to make it special. We invited all her friends from kindergarten, plus some family members. It was going to be a big celebration. The day before the party, Karen cornered me as I was getting the mail. She expressed her hope that we weren't planning to have all our guests park on the street tomorrow. When I confirmed that we were expecting quite a few guests, she became upset. Karen insisted that this was a respectable neighborhood and she wouldn't stand for it looking like a used car lot because of our party. I tried to explain that our guests needed somewhere to park and it would only be for a few hours, but Karen was having none of it. She forbade us from allowing street parking and demanded we either find alternative parking or cancel the party altogether. I was shocked. Who did she think she was to forbid anything on a public street? I tried to reason with her, but she just stomped back to her house, slamming the door behind her. The next day, the party was in full swing. Kids were laughing and playing in the backyard, music was playing, and everyone was having a great time. I'd almost forgotten about Karen's warning until I saw a police car pull up. I watched Karen bolt out of her house with a smirk on her face. She ran up to the officers as they got out of their car. Karen immediately started complaining about the parked cars and noise, insisting that the officers shut down our party and tow all the vehicles. The officers looked at each other, then at the street. There were quite a few cars, but they were all parked legally and weren't blocking anyone's driveway. The first officer told Karen that he didn't see any parking violations. He then paused to listen to the sounds of children laughing and music playing at a reasonable volume commenting that the noise didn't seem excessive to him. He asked his partner for a second opinion, and the second officer agreed that it seemed like a normal birthday party and actually sounded fun. Karen was clearly shocked by their response. She sputtered, trying to insist that they had to do something because we were disturbing the peace. The first officer calmly told her that the only person disturbing the peace at that moment was her. Then, to my utter amazement, the officer turned to me with a grin. He asked if we happened to have any extra cake, explaining that they were on their lunch break and that a little party never hurt anybody. I left and invited them into the backyard, assuring them we had plenty of food to go around. The kids were thrilled to have real police officers at the party. The officers played games with them, let them try on their hats, and even demonstrated the lights and sirens on their patrol car. It turned into the highlight of the party. All the while, Karen stood on her lawn, fuming. She was red-faced and shaking with anger. She started yelling that this was unacceptable and threatened to file a complaint against both officers, claiming they would lose their badges for this. The second officer calmly told Karen she could do what she wanted, but they were just there enjoying a nice community event. Something in Karen snapped. With a shriek of rage, she lunged at the officer, but he was ready for her. In one smooth motion, he sidestepped her attack and gently but guided her to the ground, cuffing her hands behind her back. He told her that assaulting a police officer was a serious offense and that she was under arrest. When they were leading Karen to the patrol car, the kids started cheering. Someone started a chant of, Bye bye, Karen, and soon everyone joined in. After Karen was taken away, the party continued, even more joyous than before. Our other neighbors, who had been wary of Karen for years, came out to join the celebration. It turned into an impromptu block party, with everyone sharing food and stories about their encounters with Karen. Our incident was the last straw for Karen, and she ended up facing multiple charges and eventually moved away. And that birthday party became legendary, 
in our family. Every year on my daughter's birthday, we tell the story of how a grumpy neighbor's attempt to ruin her party backfired badly. My family and I used to own our own restaurant and I loved every minute of it. The hustle, the bustle, the satisfaction of seeing happy customers. It was in my blood. But when the economy took a nosedive, we had to sell. It broke my heart, but I knew I needed to move on and find another job in the industry I loved. That's how I found myself at Sunny Side Up, a trendy brunch spot downtown. At first, I was excited. The owner seemed nice and the menu looked delicious. But then I met her, the manager. Let's call her Karen. From day one, Karen had it out for me. I couldn't figure out why until I overheard her talking to one of the other servers. She was complaining about my hiring, mentioning my past restaurant ownership experience and accusing me of waiting to steal her job. I tried to reassure her I really did. I told her that I wasn't interested in her position and that I was just there to work and learn. But Karen didn't believe me. She responded with a sarcastic comment, making it clear she didn't trust my intentions. From then on, it was a nightmare. Every extra shift, mine. The worst tasks, all me. And don't even get me started on the scheduling. Once I asked Karen if I could come in a bit late for a doctor's appointment, she guilt-tripped me, saying we were a family and I needed to pitch in. She even suggested I reschedule my appointment. It went on like this for months. I was tearing myself apart trying to please her, but nothing was ever good enough. Then in March 2021, everything came to a head. I needed surgery. Nothing too serious, but I'd need a week off to recover. When I came back, I had strict instructions from my doctor about what I could and couldn't do. No heavy lifting, limited time on my feet, that sort of thing. I showed Karen the note, hoping she'd understand. Karen responded with fake sweetness, assuring me that they'd take care of me. I should have known better. My first day back was a Saturday, our busiest day. I was alone on the barista bar, with a line out the door. The tablets for online orders were going crazy, and I had a four-table section to manage on top of it all. Servers kept pestering me for drinks, and I could feel myself getting overwhelmed. The next thing I remember is waking up on the kitchen floor, surrounded by my co-workers. My friend Jay was there, along with Karen. I could hear someone on the phone with 911. I weakly told them to hang up, explaining that I couldn't afford an ambulance. And then, I kid you not, Karen looked me dead in the eye and asked when I could go back on the floor, saying they really needed me. I just passed out, and all she cared about was getting me back to work. That was the moment I realized I was nothing but a cog in her machine. So I did what any self-respecting person would do. I told Karen she could accept my two weeks notice. I got up, brushed myself off, and walked out. The next two weeks were tense, to say the least. Karen kept trying to pile on more work, probably hoping I'd change my mind. But I didn't. On my last day, as I was hanging up my apron for the final time Karen approached me, she asked if I was really serious about leaving. I confirmed that I was and said goodbye to her. I walked out of that restaurant with my head held high. I may not have known what was next, but I knew it had to be better than working for someone who didn't even see me as a person. Later, I heard that Karen's treatment of staff finally caught up with her. The owners, fed up with the constant turnover and bad reviews, finally gave her the boot. They reached out to me offering me her position, but I politely declined. I had already moved on to bigger and better things. A small cafe where I was quite happy working at. When I was 14, my mom got sucked into the whole trading and forex thing. She quit her job, convinced she'd strike it rich. Meanwhile, Dad was clueless, working long hours to keep us afloat. Little did he know it wasn't just his paycheck keeping the lights on. At first, it was small things. Mom would ask to borrow a few bucks from my allowance, promising to pay me back. Then it escalated. My Xbox disappeared one day. When I asked about it, she brushed it off, saying she'd get me a new one soon. But that never happened. When I got older and started working part-time jobs, things got worse. Mom would borrow money from my paychecks, always with the same promise. I'll pay you back, honey. Just wait until my big trade comes through. I believed her. I mean, she was my mom. Why wouldn't I? But the big trade never came. 
But when I turned 18, I got my first credit card. Feeling all grown up, mom convinced me to let her use it just this once for a can't-miss investment opportunity. Next thing I knew, it was maxed out and she couldn't make the payments. My credit was shot before I even had a chance to build it. Through it all, I kept quiet. I didn't want to worry dad or cause problems in the family, so I played the role of the lazy freeloader while secretly trying to keep our household from falling apart. Now, at 22, I've finally moved out and started to get my life on track. But the resentment? It's eating me alive. Last week, I decided to confront mom about it. We were sitting in the living room, the same one where she'd made so many empty promises over the years. I reminded mom about her promise to help me buy a car. She acted all excited, asking if I'd found one I liked. When I told her I had and asked how much she could contribute, she just laughed and said she wasn't paying for anything. I was shocked. I brought up all the money she owed me, the thousands she'd borrowed over the years. She laughed again, claiming she didn't have any money. When I pointed out that she'd just told me earlier she had $4,000 saved up, she brushed it off saying that was for emergencies. I asked about my emergency, my ruined credit and all the things she'd pawned. She tried to dismiss it, saying it was all in the past and asking if I was still hung up on that. It was like all those years of sacrifice meant nothing to her. I asked if she was really going to pretend none of it happened. She told me she was finally getting their finances in order and asked if I couldn't be happy for her. I was furious. I told her she'd used me for years and now she was acting like I was the problem. She told me not to be dramatic, saying every family has money issues. I argued back, saying normal parents don't steal from their kids. She got defensive, insisting she never stole anything, just borrowed. I pointed out that borrowing implies intending to pay it back, which she never did. The conversation went in circles after that. Mom kept deflecting, making excuses, trying to guilt me into dropping it. But I couldn't. Not anymore. That night, I made a decision. I called my boyfriend and we made a plan. We're meeting dad next weekend to tell him everything. I've been gathering evidence, bank statements, credit reports, even some texts from mom admitting to borrowing money. I've already taken some precautions. My credit is locked down tight and I opened a separate bank account years ago that mom doesn't know about. I'm even looking into whether it's possible to change my social security number just to be safe. Part of me feels guilty. I know this will blow up our family. But a bigger part of me is tired of carrying this secret, tired of being the scapegoat, while mom gets away with everything. The day of the meeting came faster than I expected. We met dad at a quiet cafe away from the house to avoid any interruptions. I started by telling dad I needed to talk to him about mom, warning him it wouldn't be easy to hear. He looked worried and asked if everything was okay. I had to tell him that no, things hadn't been okay for a long time. I took a deep breath and started from the beginning. I told him everything, the pawned items, the stolen birthday money, the maxed out credit card. I showed him the evidence I'd gathered and I could see the shock growing on his face. Dad was stunned. He admitted he had no idea what had been going on all this time. I apologized for not telling him sooner, explaining that I was trying to protect everyone but I realized now that was a mistake. Dad said he was the one who should be sorry that he should have seen what was happening. After our talk, dad confronted mom. It wasn't pretty. There was yelling, crying, and a lot of accusations thrown around. But in the end, the truth was out. Mom's spending and gambling were cut off. Dad took control of the finances and insisted she get help for her addiction. They agreed to help me repair my credit and pay back what was taken. It's been a few months since then. Things are still tense, but they're getting better. Mom's in therapy, and she's slowly starting to understand the damage she caused. Dad and I are closer than ever. I'm finally starting to feel like I can breathe again. My credit score is slowly climbing, and I'm saving up for that car on my own terms. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching, and see you next time.